Hi everybody and welcome to the End of Sales podcast. My name is Stephen. This is another addition to our special guest series. I'm delighted to be joined by Sam Wardrop, a former South Lake FC youth captain and a current Barton player. How are you, Sam? Hi Stephen, I'm good, thank you. I'm good. No worries at all. We've got plenty to talk about for your journey for the youth system of Celtic and to what you're doing now. You're, some would say a TikTok sensation, Instagram sensation with all your coaching. How are you finding that? No, it's, it's brilliant. It's, it's been a bit different for me in the, in the last year. Um, I've went, I, I kind of switched from full-time football to part-time football and basically found myself um, doing a lot of coaching and also, as you said, TikTok superstar. What a title that is! <laughs> nah, nah, I'm, I'm only joking, but I do, I do, I do enjoy making videos, and they're kind of like educational videos um, with with what I, I've done in the past as a football player, and I just share that on TikTok and Instagram, and it seems to get quite a good response. Yeah, it definitely does. Me for one, anyway. Not afraid to say, like when you've done the the videos on TikTok about what supplements to take. I was straight over to Holland and Bar buying all the vitamins that you were taking. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get I need to get some sort of discount code set up. I need to get an affiliation <laughs> link. <laughs> well, well, look, it's helping people. But before we get get into the, the most recent stuff, we'll start where you started as a as a footballer. And I always like with our guests, on, we've had the likes of John Hearn, Patrick McNally, and Lewis Toshney. So when you go back to the start, when it's all starting for yourself, how do you get into football? What what's the passion? What's the drive? Um, so yeah, I think with anyone you probably speak to who's who's been a player, it just starts from a very very young age, and it's the same with with every every footballer that they want to be a footballer from, you know, the, the minute the minute they start kicking a ball around. But for me, I am from Glasgow, so I started playing just youngster locally, uh, local teams, that kind of thing, and then it was probably around the age of I don't know, I'd say 10, 11, 12, where you know the start you start to get that talk of all oh, professional teams. Um, pro youth teams, that sort of thing. And there's a bit of excitement around it. And at the time I was, I felt as though I was kind of excelling in, in terms of where I was playing at locally. So I made a move to a football club in, in um, Clyde Bank in Glasgow called Antonine. And it was there where it was a bit more serious. Um, it, it wasn't a professional team, it was just a bit more serious. The boys were all, had the same kind of aspirations to, to get picked up or scouted at the time is, is what it was called, to a professional team. And a few of my mates had gone there and gone to the likes of Falkirk um, so I spent a year there, uh, and it was twelve when I was twelve. I then began um, uh, going on trial with with Celtic, and I spent the summer there. I spent about eight weeks, I think, on trial, uh, and it's the same scouts that are still doing the scouting now. It was a guy, Charlie McGarvey, um, and and Mick Murphy, who um, obviously guys that just love football. They they get spread around. I think there's hundreds of them based all over, you know, the UK, and um, go out and watch all the kind of grassroots grassroots football. And they picked me up from there. So I spent eight weeks on trial at Celtic and um, went as a right winger. Ended up signing as a centre back. That's a, that's what happened to me. I started off as a striker, but got moved to centre back. That I never end up in the position basically you want to play. And I think anyway, especially in youth football, it just kind of put you anywhere and everywhere really to get I a think, game. Yeah, I think I think I think that always happens. I think because as well, you're you're still developing, you're still growing. Um, you're not really too sure where the best position for you is, and, and neither are the coaches, but. I think now it's important to to not be tied down to the one area of the pitch because as you get older, yeah. when you get to my age, it's what managers like. They like to have players in their team that can play a few areas in the pitch. Yeah, I think it, it is. You're right in a way because you you look at especially now, I was young. Don't know about yourself. All you want to do was score goals and celebrate, and you never really thought about playing right back, centre back, goalkeeping no. positions. But <clears> I think you're right when you say it's more prevalent now. You have to be adaptable to these positions. And see, when you were getting for your eight week trial, starting off at Celtic, did you think in your head like a lot of people who I asked, like the mentality side of things? When you're younger, it's more difficult to grasp when you're like 11 and 12. But when you went into that situation from playing local boys football, was that a big eye-opener for yourself? Is in like you have to meet the standards other guys are setting? Yeah, well, to, to be honest, it was the I, I know I know a lot of kids go into these kind of, they can go in even younger. So a lot of the time at the clubs like Celtic, the boys had been in from about eight, nine in these satellite centres, I think they call them. And it's they've got hundreds of kids attached to the kind of the team Celtic. I don't, I don't know what they call it. I don't know if it's like boys Celtic boys or something like that and then as they get older they refine that down and, and you get selected out of that so to be honest, I, this is my first step into a kind of professional um, team environment and it was an eye opener I do remember uh, travelling to the training with my dad and I was absolutely shitting myself um, 
and it, it, that that lasts that lasts a while because you're, you're nervous. You, you don't know how if you're going to fit in. You don't know if you're going to be good enough. You don't know what it's going to be like. But I do recall just turning up and you know having you know all the training kit given to you like this high quality night training kit. There's loads of coaches there. Everything's set up. It's all professional. It's it's completely different um, from what from what I was used to. But you quickly kind of learn to 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 love it all and, and you want to be involved in it. And and as the weeks went on during those eight weeks, I was just dying to to get signed. In. And also at the time, there was a couple of other clubs like your Falkirks and there was a few <laughs> others that started to get a kind of kind of sniff of you and, and maybe want to take you take you over to their clubs to train. And that's when Celtic just said, "Listen, right, you're you're signing here. We want we want you to stay, kind of thing." Yeah. So within the eight weeks, obviously you said there, <laughs> when you go, it's like an adjusting period. We were getting used to the, the professional setup. And I remember um, John Hearn said on, on his podcast with myself that he loved getting all that new gear, the night training gear, all the free kits and the the track suits. And, that's and you, you go into you, you go into that environment when, as you said, other clubs are sniffing around. When was the turning point for you and Celtic saying, "Look, we're, we're going to take you on." When did you know that was going to happen, or did you not know until the end? Um, no, I, I didn't really know until until then. But I think basically what had happened was I, I was going, I was in as a right a right winger, and they were they were obviously watching me, and they then they then actually watched me from my, my school club as well, um, because one of the scouts was a school teacher, and we were playing his team, and my school teacher played me as a centre back. So he's obviously gone back to the club and said, "Listen, Sam's really good centre back." So I remember the week after I went to play, I played a game for Celtic friendly game centre back. Um, and straight away after the game, they were like, "Right, c- come on, let's sign." So they're basically they're just assessing you for the, during during that time um, to see how you are in training, to see how you are in games, and to see if you're going to fit in with the team and, and with the plans. Um, but what what you were saying about the training kit is funny. I think uh, every player that, that goes to Celtic, that you obviously get to keep all the kit and boots and trainers and stuff at the end of the season, flip flops, and you end up kitting out <laughs> half the family and friends with. All the Celtic stuff I've still got, I've got loads of. But you don't know what to do with it because you don't want to chuck it out because it's good. It's good quality stuff, you know. Yeah, you can send it to me. I'll send me a dress off her, and then we can. <laughs> like, well, when, when you when you sign for Celtic, is that signing? Because I'm not led to believe it's like an S form, is it? Is that like the school type contract where you're still going to school at that age? Is, is that the type of contract you signed at that moment? Yeah, yeah. I think I, I don't I don't know the, the the exact terms, but I think it's. It's it's fairly informal, you know. There's nothing tying you there to the club other than for that season. So when I was twelve, I signed that, and you know you just keep signing those until you you get to fifteen, sixteen, uh, and then that's when the transition is into um, your first professional contract. And how how was that like when you're joining the twelve? Can you remember any coaches back then that would have kind of guided you and give you like a, a positive influence where you're thinking I can actually make the grade here? To, aim for that contract when you're 15 or 16 was there anyone even at that young age that helped you along um so so one thing i do i do recall just from from the years of football i mean your coaches change every year and and looking back now it's it's more for me that there isn't one coach that stands out in, in particular but it's more just obviously the coaches there they're they're, they're, they're very high quality that they're, they're very good coaches they, they know exactly what they're doing or, or else they wouldn't be there so you do, for me anyway, looking back, I just seem to have picked up the kind of, the, the best bits and the best ideas from these coaches, the things that I really liked, the things that I, I thought worked well for me. Uh, and as you grow older, as you shape into your own kind of player, your own individual, um, for me anyway, you kind of take all the, the best bits that you've learned from, whether it be the football coaches, the sports scientists, the nutritionists, um, sprint coaches, physios, you take all the best bits, all the stuff that you think is really valuable um, and you become your own kind of ex- expert, almost uh, in a sense. See, like, see as well. It interests me, like, trying to get that pro contract. And you say coaches give you the advice, and you take the best bits and things like that. In between them three years, is was there a time that you thought maybe this isn't for me? Like, a part of your mind saying, "I, I can't make it here," because you see, at Celtic Football Club, it's all mentality: win, 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 trophy, trophy, trophy. Did you see other players kind of go in a shell, and you see them disappear from? from like the situation from training and they kind of leave Celtic on, on, on their cloud because they can't cope with that pressure. Did you ever feel that at, at that age? Um, I think I think so. But again, it's it, football at any age, it's it's up and down, it's it's constant. And I think sometimes though when it when it's not going well, when it's going bad, it's it's easy to think, right, that's it. I, I'm gonna have to chuck this. It's not working for me. I'm not good enough. I don't I'm not enjoying it. But I think 
I think some players do chuck it when they do feel like that. Um, and then the ones who don't chuck it, the ones who kind of see that kind of down, that kind of lower period, when they see that through and they come back up to the high again, that's the ones that are still there. It's just it's probably a bit of a mentality, but also um, support as well from coaches, friends, family. Um, and just knowing that if you're having a bad spell, it won't last. Because um, the, the best examples are, well, the best example that I can think of was, is KT, who was um, obviously my age group and I grew up with him at Celtic. And he, you've probably heard the stories before, he wasn't the first name in the team sheet when he was 13, 14, 15. Um, yeah. But he still turned up every day, still trained, still played the games that he was told to play, maybe not with the age group he wanted to play, that sort of thing. And it goes it goes with other boys as well, but just using KT as an example. And he saw through maybe periods where he thought, like, why, why am I not playing? Why, why am I not getting a chance? Blah, blah, blah. And he saw those through. He, he kept working hard. He didn't lose any discipline. And he was then rewarded when things started to turn and, and come back into his favour. But the reason boys drop out is because when it does get tough, I think I think boys do it. Well, they do. They, they just they just they kind of give up in a sense and, and maybe settle for something at a lower level, that kind of thing. Yeah. I've, for me as well, you, you mentioned the standards. I always remember like playing that Saturday football in your, your local league. I remember one time we were playing a local match and one of our players was down injured. And you know, way you, you see the professional physios coming on, but our physio walks on the pitch with a cigarette in his mouth and a sponge. That's, <laughs> that, that's, that, that's the difference between them levels. That's the only level I can make it up. But like, as you mentioned, like KT, yourself, and that age group, when you're going through them bad times and you get to that 15, 16 mark and you're all fighting for that professional contract, because I can imagine maybe it, is, it gets really competitive around about yeah. then because everyone wants to stay. When, for yourself, did you know that the contract was going to be on the table or was it a game on them things that make you just wait to that final moment so you don't kind of give up giving the effort every other day in training? Yeah, so, I mean, my, my age group was actually, we were actually a very good age group, so the majority of us from the age of 12, 13, there was a squad about 15, 16, 17, 18. It was a core squad and, and we, we all got our contracts and all, and all had at least a few years in it full time. But just in that age, in that time from going from 12 up until about 15, 16, you go through, obviously you get sent to the St. Ninians, the school project, stuff like that. So you're completely like immersed into this like Celtic bubble and you can't, you, you, there's nothing like almost like you, you, you kind of cut off yourself from your friends and stuff because you don't have time, you're, up at 6am, you're going to training in the morning, you're going to school, you're going straight to Lennox Town to get your dinner, to study, and then to train again. You're home at about 8, 9pm, so you're literally engrossed for, you, you, you don't know any difference. So when it does does come to 15, 16, um, the majority of us fortunately did did get that first contract, but it's there was maybe there was maybe maybe a couple who didn't, and it's probably it's tough because it's all you've been, all you've known the last few years and then to not get a contract and then have to try and reintegrate yourself to another football club back in with your friends, it's very difficult because you've missed the kind of four or five years of, of growing up um, as a youngster. But there's a lot of sacrifices. You, you don't get to live the same kind of life as your your school friends um, as such. But um, for me anyway, I, I wouldn't have changed it because the experiences I had at Celtic were unbelievable in terms of just the way you got looked after, you travelled the world. Um, you got to do all these amazing things. Um, Speak, speaking about traveling the world and stuff, <clears throat> is that does that happen from a very like early age in the 12, 13, 14? Do you just go to them tournaments? Is that like a grounding experience when you're doing that? Yeah, I think I think that's a, a really important part of the, the youth the youth academy and developing players and the experiences they give you. I think all, all the top clubs in Europe, you get to know all the top players at your age group in Europe and. I mean, I, I've played against boys who are top, top players now, um, but you, you know who they are because you played against them as a youngster, and I think that's it's invaluable. Um, I mean, from European trips, to we went over to Shanghai, we went over to uh, Durban in South Africa, um, Qatar, um, you literally travel the globe, and I think, obviously, fortunately, because you're at Celtic, you get more opportunities because it is such a big club, um, but th- those basically were th- those basically open your eyes to, to kind of different parts of the world and different types of football when you're doing that from the age of 12 all the way up till 20, 21 um, years of age. So it's, it's, it's honestly, that's probably one of the most special things about, but from, from my, from my, my from me kind of looking back, that's one of the most special things about being at a club like Celtic was the opportunities yeah. you got really. Well, was there any particular uh, tournament 
that stood out to you? Because you, you said there you played against some cracking players who are like top players. Now, was there any particular game that you're thinking you're in, in this game and you're like, he's going to be top, this guy's going to be top, and you're just like, wow, with the standard even at that early age? Yeah, I mean... I mean, even I, I, we 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 did do a lot of trips, and so one one two stand out in my mind the most. One of them was we went down to um, England to play the, the the Nike the Nike Cup, and the winners of that got to go to Shanghai. We were the complete underdogs, and you're playing against Chelsea's and Liverpool's, um, and we made it to the final, beat Chelsea, and you're playing against guys like um, you know you're Ruben Loftus Cheek for for Chelsea, you're playing against guys like Harry Wilson for for Liverpool. And, and, and a load of other boys, like a, a lot of them are still playing at top level championship, premiership um, in England. And we won that. And then you got to travel to, over to Shanghai for the world finals, which was against, it was an, an international finals kind of thing. Um, so that that was one that stood out in my mind. But then also we did, um, I was away with the Scotland youth team and we went to the Euro finals for under 17. And again, you're playing against, um, you know, ger- teams like Germany and Portugal um, Renato Sanchez for Portugal. You're getting, playing against England. You've got um, Paddy Roberts and Joe Gomez and all these guys who are the, who are the same age as me. And it was just just to, to to play against those kind of players at that age. It's, it's interesting because it's interesting to see who who develops and kicks on from there. Because um, obviously there's, yeah. there's a small number of players who do. But I mean, just just getting the kind of opportunity to play against each other. It's it's pretty special. The, it's even the name of them players, Paddy Roberts. All, every Celtic fan knows him from his time at uh, Celtic, and then Joe Gomez for, has formed a crack and partnership with Van Dyke. And you, you go through the list that when you play long years. But what what's amazing is, as you said, you go down to England, and a lot of times, as you said, the Scottish clubs, no matter who they are, always viewed as underdogs. But Celtic won that tournament. Do you know what I mean? So that's a, that's another positive of a youth academy that you can always say you, you were a part of. And see when you're signing that professional contract, how, how are you feeling? Is it like? For me, anyway, I'd probably be bawling my eyes out. I, I, I couldn't hold my nerve. Like, but is it something that you're with your family? You're sitting with a chairman. You're talking for everything. Is it just a surreal moment in your in your career so far? Yeah, I mean, it's it was it's pretty cool. I still remember it well. I had the full family along, um, and you go down to Celtic Park and um, you sign your contract and you get all your pictures and stuff taken. Um, and it is. I mean, I mean, I, th- I would say it at the time because you've been involved in the club for so long. It's it's almost. N- like it's almost kind of uh, you, you don't you don't you kind of uh, maybe overlook the kind of magnitude of um, signing signing a contract for Celtic as a young player um, because you've been there for so long you almost feel it's it's kind of part part of the process but I mean looking looking from the outside in it's a it's a very 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 special special thing special moment um, but yeah that that was that, that's that's one of the ones that sticks out in my mind as well but again at the time it's it's all very competitive because I do remember. There's some boys maybe getting one year deals, or some boys maybe getting two year deals and three year deals, and you know there's, you're always chatting in amongst the teammates, and it's, there's always a kind of internal uh, power play between the players, which is natural. It's just it's just the, the the competitive nature of being at a club like that, and I think the reason yeah. our, our our age group did so well was because we were all extremely competitive. We all wanted to be better than each other, but in a healthy way, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, the, I think. It, at top clubs, anyway, you do need that level of competition. Otherwise, it would just get stale and everyone yeah. would stagnate and not want to do better. And see, when you signed that professional contract from a personal point of view, mm-hmm. is that when, when you're going to the professional status, you're you're joining the club, you're doing training and stuff, is that when everything kind of took off and the standards even went up a notch from what you were doing previously? Yeah, exactly. Because the minute you sign, uh, you basically sign that in the, in the kind of off, off season between... Um, leaving school from from training in the evenings to then going to full time football, um, so your your life completely changes. You're you're getting paid money. You're kind of uh, I, I remember obviously initially I was only fifteen at the time because I've got a kind of October birthday, so I was a bit later. So I, I ended up getting I think it happens sometimes if you're not sixteen, um, come the start of the season you get paid expenses until you turn sixteen. Yeah. So I remember getting it was like a hundred pound a week expenses, um, and I was getting. Because I can drive around and you get the train uh, from from where I stayed into the Marnock, you get picked up on a minibus and drove over to. Because at the time, you, when you go first first year full time, first two years full time, you go down to Barryfield, um, yeah. and that's basically it's basically the, the biggest test to to one see if you can handle full time football before you make the step up to Lennox Town. So it's almost like a kind of initiation year. Um, so yeah, you you get the train down. Um, if you're tracky on your wash bag. 
down down into to Dumanic. They pick you up in the mini bus, drove along to to Celtic Park or or Barrowfield where they train where the training ground is. You would get changed out onto the pitch. Um, you'd, you'd obviously get your shower after and head over to the stadium where you would get your lunch, and then you'd be dropped back at the train station and and, and back home again. And I used to get slagged rotten because uh, it was actually, it was actually when I, the second year when I moved up to Lennox Town. Still didn't drive because I was a bit younger, so I used to cycle my bike um, to a kind of pick-up point, and they used to terrorise me for it because it was brown the bike. So I got slagged rotten for cycling a, a brown bike <laughs> to get picked up, but I had no other option. Um, and and it's funny because looking back, like yeah, I was cycling a good fifteen twenty, not not far, fifteen twenty minutes to get picked up and drove and drove into training where you've got you know all the first team players who are driving in and they're they're big fancy cars, and I'm I'm pelting along the streets uh, where I stay in this <laughs> this wee tatty bike and chaining it up. <laughs> and, and the full Celtic gear, all the night gear, and all. <laughs> That's it. That's it. But, but, see, um, see but those, see, sorry, on you go. See, see as well. So I'm sorry there, but see, see when you you do that first year and you, you're chaining their bar feed, you're going to Celtic Park, and who would have been about the scene then at that kind of level in terms of like coaches or maybe people who can do the watch training? Was there anyone? When you sign that contract, I know we talked about it previously, but youth youth level that is does change a lot in terms of coaching. Yeah. But when you go up to the professional side of things, is there like a constant kind of person there giving you advice, telling you what to do, uh-huh. and how to make that step up? Who who would that have been for you? Um. So the first year full time down at Barrowfield, you had Tommy McIntyre and Neil Drag Kravokipic. I think I've pronounced that right. You've probably heard of the two though. Uh, yeah. Two of them. Yeah. Um, and you also had a uh, sports scientist, Scott Brady. Um, it was actually, we had a couple of, of sports scientists because it kind of in between. We had a guy, Ian Call, as well. I, I got on well with Ian Call. I liked him. He was good. And, and to be honest with you, naturally, I'm, I'm quite, a, I, I rely on kind of my athletic ability and I'm really interested in it. I like uh, working in the gym. I like getting myself fast and strong. Um, and, and the guy, the sports scientist, Ian Call, was kind of my first intro to to that kind of performance side off off the pitch, um, and I, I I got on well with him. I um, mean, obviously you've got your physio and your kit man Hugh McGovern, um, legend. G- guys like guys like the I mean it sounds daft, but guys like the kit man probably teach you the most because they're in uh, Hugh, Hughie's in the dressing room with you. He's he's telling you about all the players in the past, uh, what it took to to get to make the step up, um, how to kind of stay grounded, what you should do. In terms of just just wee things like keeping your your boots clean, tidying the dressing room, putting the kit away, having high standards, and just kind of keeping you right on and off the pitch. Because obviously the coaches there, Tommy and Mio, are there to coach you, make you a better player on the pitch. But quite often the making of you is, is off the pitch. You know what you do when you go home, what you do when you're not training. So guys like Hugh McGovern, the kit man, they're they're kind of invaluable parts of the club. And I don't just mean for my age group, but I mean for every age group. Every boy that was growing up and, and played for Celtic and made his debut for Celtic will have came into, came into kind of contact with guys like him who really kind of, um, they've been at the club for so long, they kind of basically share um, how, 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 you, how you need to behave, how you need to um, act as a, as a young Celtic player. Um, but Mio, Mio Drag was brilliant as well. I really like working with him. He's a European, um, Montenegro, I'm sure. Um, and he, he, he was he was fantastic, a really good coach, really good technical coach, worked with um, top, top players like Matic, um, you know, down at, who was down at Chelsea, um, and he had a wealth of experience, wealth of knowledge, and, but fortunately the, the two of them were actually centre-backs, so it was good, it helped, it helped myself <laughs> as a defender. Yeah, and, and, and always fascinates me, John Hearn gave me a good shout as well, when he was on with us, said he was a, a fantastic coach, and when, when you're doing that, obviously, the f- the first year you're in, you're getting your feet in, you're doing the, the full-time training and the things. And I think you're right when you say the, the, the kit man. You see John Clark gets a lot of mention by first-team yeah. players, and, as you said, Hugh McGovern. But it sounds trivial, but a professional footballer is all the way from when you get up out of bed in the morning. Like very much what your TikTok videos do now, it explains the routine that you have to go through. And mm-hmm. as you said, you make that sacrifice, but at the end of the day, if you keep going, you'll get rewarded at the end. And when, when you do that, that first year and you go into the second year is, is that when you said you went up to Lennox Town and started yeah, training? Yeah, so, so after you spend one year at Barrowfield and essentially that's that's the that's the, the making of you that's, that's basically it's a good opportunity for the club to see if you can handle it and after that if, they, if they're if they happy with you and you've been doing, you're doing yourself justice you move up to Lennox Town and obviously that's when you 
things become really serious. You know, you're there every day with the first team players, the first team staff. Um, and as you said, John, John Clark's obviously the kit man there. He was brilliant as well. He was always uh, heart, uh, strict on the boys, but very, very fair. And again, someone who's been in the club for a long, long time and knows. Uh, same with Danny McGrain. Danny, Danny was up there. I got on really well with Danny, obviously being a fullback as well. Um, and it's guys like that who just know the club inside and out and just know what it takes, know the standards that you should be bringing every single day kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it, I asked Patrick Manelius because he was he's from here and he went over for trials and stuff to Danix Town and it might sound a bit geeky from my point of view, but I, I just, as you said, you're interested in fitness. I, I like to know about the facilities. Is that like how, what's mm-hmm. Danix Town like as a training facility to you? Is it spectacular? Is it standard? What What is it to you? No, it's um, it it was it was phenomenal. I mean, I'm I'm one. Um, I always get slagged when I went away with with the with the when I was a youth player. When I went away with the team, you know, you travel the world, and I'd be always be taking pictures and stuff because I was amazed by, you know, facilities and in, in, in different places as well, and just generally a tourist. When you went to places like Shanghai and yeah. South Africa, I thought it was all amazing. So when I was, I do remember when I was up at next town, like every day, I, I would I would you, you do have to take it in because. Especially when the sun's shining. When the sun's not shining up at Lennox Town, it's horrific because it is quite exposed. It's on a hill. Um, yeah. But you've got the, the grass pitches are phenomenal. You've got grass pitches for, you've got multiple grass pitches for all the, the first team players, the youth players. You've got a brilliant astro pitch outside. You've got an indoor AstroTurf pitch. Um, loads of changing rooms. There was also inside you had basically kind of, when you, so, so again, it's part of the initiation process. So you move up to Lennox Town and you're not quite in the reserve dressing room. You're in, a uh, dressing room just off it and if you kind of um, do yourself justice again you'll, you'll move into the reserve dressing room and then if you do yourself justice there you move into the first team dressing room um, so it's a big complex you've obviously got your canteen you've got a swimming pool you've got ice baths you've got warm baths you've got saunas you've got steam rooms um, you've got the boot room you've got physio rooms you've got media rooms dining room um, games room you know you've got everything there it's like a little kind of mini Many, many kind of hub um, where you get yeah. everything you could possibly need. The facilities were fantastic. But one, one thing I would say is I think it could be bigger. They've got a lot of space up there to, where they could develop. So I think I think there was always talk of plans to do that. Um, but yeah, facilities think, yeah. were fantastic. I think the talk was around the indoor pitch, wasn't it? Always to kind indoor. of make that bigger. Yeah. Aye, because it is quite. I don't know if you've ever been up to Lansdowne, but that is quite small. And obviously, when the when the winter comes. Um, you, you, it would be. There's only one under. There's an under soil heat, heated pitch outside, uh, one of the grass ones. But that's probably not enough when you've got the youth team up there as well. You know. Yeah, but like yourself, I'm I'm just interested in that side of things. I think facilities. You look at training grounds and stuff in school and all. I used to type the annex down in and go on Google Images and see what I can <laughs> see of it. It's just it's just something that's always interests me. But thanks for letting me know that. And we'll talk about winning stuff now. And you were the youth captain on their twenties and things like that. So what type what type of memories do you have? coming up for the, the age ranks when you signed a professional contract of games, winning trophies? Was it just like, a, as as was said before, the mentality was win, 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 trophy, trophy, trophy? Is that what it was like from early on? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Like, no matter what the challenge was, whether it be a European competition or domestic competition, um, the mentality was always to win. And to be honest with you, as players or myself anyway, you never really doubted... Um, your team's ability, even if you were coming again, coming up against teams like your Barcelona, your AC Milan, your Ajax, you still at the back of mind. At the back of your mind, thought everyone here, everyone in my Celtic team is a very good player, so we we we've got the ability to beat them. Um, and then obviously domestically, you've got the Glasgow Cup when you're younger. Then you've got the youth cups up until you're about you know nineteen twenty. And from my experience growing up, I was fortunate. I, I quite often played in the youth cups. Um, whether it be through having a good season, you moved up an age group, or maybe just it's your luck, maybe someone got injured. So I was involved in quite a good few victories as a young as a young player. And I do remember even then, when you're 15, 16, 17, you're looking up at the guys who are 18, 19, 20, and you know, they look like men. They've been up working in the gym for, for years with the sports scientists and obviously got a couple of years on you. So you're looking up to these guys uh, and taking kind of inspiration from the way they carry themselves on the pitch and off the pitch. Um, guys like Owen O'Connell and Stuart Finlay, they were they were good professionals. Just I remember playing alongside the two of them. Um, but yeah, it, it was always ingrained, didn't you? Like it was almost like if you didn't win, it was it, it, it was a rarity because you were so confident. There was just so so much momentum with the Celtic age groups that you just you, you were always winning, kind of thing. Yeah, I, th- it's, I think it was 
the mentality side of things is the key part here that kind of establishing you have to be right focused and as well you said there you have to be physically fit and I've got down here as well that in 2017 you captain sadly did a Scottish Youth Cup final how, how how was that for you as an experience of winning the trophy with Celtic and being the captain as well was that like a was that a really proud moment in your yeah. Celtic career so far yeah definitely definitely that that was probably one of my most enjoyable seasons and um, because obviously I'd I'd been there for a good few years at this point and I was given the captaincy for the kind of the under twenties or uh, team that season, playing in the league and also playing in the youth cup. And um, to be honest, I've just, it probably now it probably now links into my coaching. I do I do enjoy having a level of responsibility and and guiding others um, and co- and coaching others. So I really I really did enjoy having that that role. And obviously, winning the the youth cup final, we, we played Rangers, um, and I'm pretty sure it was like we we we, we fairly battered them. Um, and then obviously. <laughs> You got to lift the trophy, and yeah, that that definitely that's that's one of my um, nice memories of, of being there. Who who would have been in your your team then? Who would have been in that starting lineup? Um, so, like, that's, that's, that's a good question. I don't. So I think it would have been uh, Anthony Ralston right back. Um, I was in at centre back with Jamie McCart. I think left back was Aidan McIlduff. I'm not sure if you remember Aidan McIlduff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, would have been Ross Duhan or Connor Hazard in goals and in terms of other players Regan Henry Calvin Miller um, Mikey Johnson would have been playing uh, Mark Cow, uh, Joe Thompson and Aidan Nisbet that would have been the team that's a, that's a good team most of them players I recognise their names obviously because I, I take a keen interest anyone who listens to the podcast know that I'm very under the youth side of things. It likes of this season. You see Dembele, Yoko Flex mm-hmm. hoping to get a chance. And I think w- when you look back at your your time with Celtic at that level, is it something you said the coaching side of things there, and you were the captain? I noticed this about a lot of captains as well. When you look around the, the European football landscape, anyway, it's almost like as you said, it's something you thrive on, where you get to tell people, look, be here, be there, do this, try this, and is that something you you like doing within that team? Were you comfortable doing that? Is you took that yeah. in your stride? Yeah, no, no, I really did. And it's almost like you're, you're, you're essentially almost the rock for the team. Like, if things aren't going bad for you, you know, the players around you are looking to you for that kind of support, encouragement and, and inspiration. Um, but what I would say as well is that I was one of the kind of senior players that then at that time in the squad. So you, you've got responsibility. The younger players looking up to you, just like I used to do when I used to look up to the likes so, of uh, Owen and Stuart Finlay and Jamie Lindsay, guys like that kind of thing. Yeah. And it is important. See, after that final as well, did you get a chance, maybe a wee bit after that, to train with the first team? Did you get a chance to train with the first team? Yeah, so I think that was one of my that was one of my better seasons. Um, and I think it was after that season I got got opportunities to train with. I, I can't quite remember. It was a it was a bit of Dyla, John Collins, um, and then it was into Brendan Rogers. And I did get an opportunity to train. Um, and the the, the, team, the team at that time was was very very good as you know, uh, and I've managed to get myself into a friendly match squad against Leon, and I played I played against Leon in a preseason friendly, um, but it was at that time I then went out on loan to Dumbarton. So you, I mean to be honest with you, when you're up at Lennox Town, um, you do get an opportunity to train with the first team fairly regularly, and that was something. It, it, it was a, it's a funny one as well. I don't know if any other guys have told you the story, but. Uh, every morning you would sit in the reserve uh, dressing room and basically the reserve players wore black socks and the first team players wore white socks. <laughs> so the kit man, Hughie McGovern, would come in with a big bundle of white socks and he'd obviously been told who, who to hand them out to. So you'd be sitting there and it was a toss up between you really wanted the socks, but you also really didn't want the socks because it meant <laughs> you had to get yourself mentally prepared to go and train with the first team. So he'd be handing the socks out round the dressing room and everyone would be sitting there in silence um, just waiting to to be given a pair. Um, but it's f- things like that that stick out in your mind. But obviously, w- when you did go over and train, like the standard was just up another another level, another notch. The intensity, the work rate of the of the of the players, it was unbelievable. See, see as well that when you get that the shout to call like with the train with the first team and you, you've won the trophies and stuff, and you think to yourself, obviously getting yourself mentally prepared to, to go down and do that. When you go and step in the pitch with them, is it one of them again moments where you're thinking, "Shit, I have to start over again and impress these people," and you're like, yeah, "I've yeah. done it already." Is that how how you cope with that? Did you just go back to square one again and try your best to impress the first time to try and fit in? Um, to, to be honest with you, I just generally every single day, 
it, it was all like it, I, I know you say about the winning your cups and you've done you've done a bit, but to be honest with you, for me as a player, like no matter what you do, you're every single day you have to go out there and and train as hard as you can and prove that you're a good player because no matter what level you play at, even first team players now in, in at top top clubs, if you if you start walk or turn up to training or games thinking, oh, I've achieved all this, well, I can I can relax today. That's that's when things start to go wrong for you. So every single day, I would try and get myself in the best condition possible by doing everything I could off the pitch. And then when it came to, to turning up on the pitch, it meant you'd done half the hard work and you could just go out knowing that, that you were ready for the session and, and give it everything you've got. Was there any players at that particular time took you on under the under ring, helped you along that process? Um, to be honest with you, it was more like it was mostly just um, guys like obviously we played with Katie, um, but he to me he was one of the one of the players who you, you just every single day he would he would turn up with a level of intensity um, to train. He'd be sprinting out onto the training pitch first thing in the morning. Um, and same with Scott Brown. For me, those two were the two I kind of looked up to the to the most in terms of like I, I was almost in awe of, of of how they were able to turn up every day with that level of intensity, with that work ethic. So I always tried to I always tried to emulate that in myself. Um, but then also off the pitch, uh, guys like Lustig and Colo Turi um, and Sviatchenko, I remember they were always in the gym, and obviously that was an important aspect to me as well. So I would watch yeah. these guys doing their stuff in the gym, and I would just I would just copy them. I would just do whatever they were doing because I was thinking, if they're doing it, it must be work. Um, it, it must work. So, and um, for me, it was always every day was a day to kind of learn from from the senior players. And I, again, I would just try and take wee things that they did and bring them on, bring them into my own my own game. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like maybe your vitamins, isn't it? Shoot over a hole in the yeah. bar. Let's get them in. But <laughs> That's it. See, see as well. Touching upon uh, Kieran Tierney briefly before we move on to your your little move in your current career at Dumbarton. How, how did he, as you said, he, he wasn't the first name on the team sheet when you were in the same squads together at youth level and things. So I know he got his chance in the European game against Fernabache. Uh, Ronnie Daly gave him his chance. But how do you think, it's an interesting story that he made the jump from like, kind of not being the first name on the team sheet to being the icon at Celtic for the years he was there with Scott Brown as well? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I would say... The, well, the, the first thing for for KT would be just his his work ethic, and he would say this he would say this to you as well if, if you chatted to him. His his work ethic is phenomenal, and I think that's why he's in he's in the position he is, and that's why he got himself in the position he was in at Celtic, and now he's doing it at Arsenal as well. Obviously, he's been a bit unfortunate with some of the injuries, but that's just that's just football. But the the first thing he would say is he works hard, um, and he's earned everything he's got because of that work ethic he has. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, as I said earlier, it's just in football you, you have these peaks and you have these troughs, and it's just it's just sticking with it and seeing it through and, and continuing to to believe in yourself. But but obviously, undoubtedly, Katie's naturally football ability is very very good as well, or or he wouldn't be playing at the level he's at. Yeah, I think he's fairly improved that Arsenal team, like especially as you said, when he's not being injured or whatever, he's he's the mainstay of that Arsenal team, but. In that summer window, you did make the move to Dumbarton to go on loan. Mm-hmm. And what was it you that kind of forced it? Or did you think to yourself, I need to play first-team football for me to improve rather than staying at youth level? Yeah, I mean, so I remember that was the season. I can't quite remember if it was um, Brendan. That, that was the that season after I'd, I'd won the, the Youth Cup. Um, mm-hmm. And I'd had a really good season, the, the one before. And... I was hoping, to be honest with you, to get an opportunity um, in, the, in the first team, more opportunities uh, in training and games. And it was kind of coming to the end of the, towards the end of the window. And I remember Chris McCarts, the head of the, the youth academy there. Um, and by this stage, there was pro- there was only three of us left in terms of from my age group. Uh, well, four, including KT, but KT was playing in the first team. So there was only three of us left. I think it was me, Jamie McCart and Aidan Nisbet. And essentially, the three of us were there. And you're either going to go on loan or you're going to stay and be part of the first team squad. Um, so after, obviously, between myself and Chris McCart and Brendan Rodgers, you would have a dialogue and say, listen, is Sam going to get a chance to play here? Is he going to be part of the squad or should I go out on loan? And came to the decision that uh, I, I should go out on loan because I wasn't going to be part of the squad that season. So that's that's what happened. And I went to Dumbarton, who were in the championship at the time. 
uh, and that was under Stephen Aitken and Ian Durant, who, uh, to be honest with you, I actually really, really, I loved my time at Dumbarton um, when I was there. Had a really good squad, a lot of experienced players, um, obviously Ian Durant. Um, it had a, a, a very good football career as well, so it was a very experienced player. Uh, and Stevie was a very good manager, good, very good man motivator, um, and I really, really enjoyed it. We, we did we did have a good squad, um, and that was my first spell of first-team football, which you need at that age, because one thing yeah. I always say is, are you 18, are you 19, are you 20, are you going to stay and play reserve football again for another year, or are you going to go out and get a season of, of first-team games under your belt? Because when your contract does finish when you're 19, 20, and you've got two or three seasons of first-team football under your belt, you're going to have a better chance of playing somewhere else um, if you if you were to then, rather than someone who's played three or four seasons at that age, of just continuing to play youth team football, you know? Yeah, that that's forward planning on your part, isn't it? Because, as, as I said there, you're rather not, play, well, play youth football is good up to a point, and then you need to go out and sample men's football. And as you said, if the thing arises where you get released from your parent club, there'll be more clubs kind of sniffing around you. I actually quite like that point. But see, when you, you first went to Dumbarton, and you went into the dressing room, and let's be honest, like the championship football obviously is different standard to the SPL where Celtic are, but it's proper men's football down there, isn't it? So, what was it something that was hard for you to adjust to being around, obviously getting looked after all the time at Celtic, and you're kind of at the Barton, where maybe with a level of standard in terms of training and stuff isn't up to that scratch? But is it something that you that you found hard adjusting to, or was it something again that you, your mentality just was like, I'll do this and I'll improve? Um, so, so what what I would say is, um, I would say in terms of obviously the, the facilities and um, things off the pitch aren't as as professional as they are at a club like Celtic because and the only reason for that is because a club like Dumbarton doesn't have the money for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was one thing that kind of opens your eyes up and you're like, right, okay, this is this is actually what football is like for a lot of a lot of players, a lot of clubs in Scotland. Um, it's not it's not glamorous. You're not in a bubble. Um, it's it's quite it's it's hard work. You need to look after yourself, kind of thing. Um, but in terms of the standard of training, one thing I noticed straight away was because I mean, at that level, you've got a real mix of players. You've got young players who are trying to make a name for themselves. You've got um, guys who have found their level, and you've also got guys who've played at a higher level who are maybe a bit older. Um, so the demands were probably more at that at that training than, than it would be at youth training anyway at, at Celtic. Always the first team training is, is comparable, but for youth, youth team at Celtic, you've not got men, you know, screaming down your down your throat, obviously in a constructive way, uh, demanding yeah. more from you. You don't get that really at, at youth training level, but you do at men's first team training level because at the end of the day, these guys um, are want, wanting to get the win bonuses at the weekend. There's, there's pressure on them to... To, to, to kind of bring as much money in as they can. Um, so that was one thing that was definitely an eye-opener. Obviously, the, 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 can, the, the facilities and stuff aren't as good, but that, you accept that because you know it's, it's a financial thing, but the standards are, are just as high. Um, maybe not the same technical, you know, nice quality football, but the demands are still there, um, and that mm-hmm. really, really shapes you. And for me, I think, I think, a, lot of play, I think a lot of young players going into an environment, environment like that could, could either kind of curl up in a ball or really thrive in it. And I, and I really enjoyed it. I really thrived um, in, in the environment when I was there. Is it, see when you go in as well, you said there's like a mixture of three groups. You've got the young players, the players who found that level where they're comfortable at, and then you've got the seasoned professionals who've played in, at higher levels for other clubs. When, when you're in that training, and as you said, there's players shouting and telling you what to do. And for me anyway, I said this previously on a podcast, if I got shout out on a pitch, I would automatically react and give give something back and I know professional stuff say that's not the right way to do obviously I, I'm not professional so I always give a bit back to the, either the manager or coach which is bad on my part yeah. but is that something that you found hard to deal with people shouting at you especially coming from Celtic where you're kind of not muddy coddled I wouldn't say but you're looked after you're told this and that and you, yeah. as you said you went to this environment where people are shouting is that hard to cope with at first um, I, I would say I think I think I think it I think it could be I think it could be, but I think you need to remember as well and, and also if you've got good teammates in, in that environment like for example, I remember turning up I remember I remember making my debut for Dumbarton and uh, it was a goal kick and I've dropped short to get the ball off the keeper and he's passed me the ball and I've passed it back to him and he's sliced it right up into the air 
and the ball and everyone's going mental. The the gaffer's screaming at me. The centre backs are screaming at me, and you're like, you're like, what the hell? Like I'm trying, I'm trying to kind of get on the ball and play football. Um, yeah. And, and you're like, you're like, you're, you're kind of shitting yourself, and you, you're almost. I was a wee bit. I remember just going out in a wee bit of a shell, but then at half time, um, you know, the players come up to me and going, listen, Sam. This is you're not a Celtic. We're not getting on the ball at every opportunity off the keeper because look, look what just happened, kind of thing. And and and, and quite often, if you do have t- good teammates, which I did, they explain and they chat to you and they say, "Listen, this, it's not personal. If, if we have a go at you or we demand more from you, it's not personal. Um, it's just, it's just, it's just the way, it's just the way we do it." And and you get to kind of understand that as well. And plus, also, m- maybe now I'm a bit older, so if. if I mean, I'm, I'm still at Barton. If, if someone has a go, you know, you have a go back. But when you're 18, 19, you just kind of take it and you're like, um, and, 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 ho- and hopefully if, if they're a good pro, um, they'll come and communicate with that, c- communicate that to you and have a chat to you. Yeah. I, I always find it difficult to, to take that, like someone shouting and stuff. And I've, I've seen it before in chess rooms and things. And you're, you're biting your tongue, but you want to say something back. And see, see when you're, you were at the Barton for that first loan spell, I've got here as well. You scored your first senior goal against Inverness. How how was that feeling for yourself when you're scoring was, a goal? Yeah, no, that that was amazing as well. That's one of the that's one of the things I look back on, and that was a that was an amazing moment because that was a winner. Actually, it was my first goal. Um, it was against Inverness. Big game. Um, and it was it was amazing. I I, I remember it. It's, it was really special. That was. <laughs> My first and last. That was the last time I scored. <laughs> I don't know what's happened. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get up front there. Change of position. Oh, I know. So we'll, we'll move on to the end of that loan, that loan spell. And I've I've got down here as well that you say you, you did you get released from Celtic when you were back, or was it? How did uh, that yeah. process go? So it was it was the end of that season. That was so that was my final con- my final year my contract at Celtic, um, and that's when I came back. Uh, obviously, I returned to the club after my loan spell. Uh, just for a few weeks, you know, before you break up for off season, um, yeah. and again, that's when you have the the, the second discussion with the manager, uh, Chris McCart, to say, listen, is, is there a future here for me? And there, there wasn't, so you, you you move on, and and you start, I've got agents to look after me, and you communicate that to them. They have a chat to the club, and to be honest with you, it's one thing I do remember. I mean, I I don't know. I, I've I've said it before in a, in a couple of podcasts, but um, to me. Brendan Rodgers really sticks out in my mind as being, and there's only one reason why he's doing so well is because his ability at man management and communicating to people is is honestly it's, it's incredible. And when I was I was leaving Celtic, obviously, and he's not, I wasn't part of his team, I wasn't part of his his long term plans, but he still, um, you know, he took me in a couple of times for meetings and, and had a chat to me and discussed where I, I should be looking to go in the future and. Um, and I asked him what kind of level he saw me playing at, and just for him to 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 do that is is, is special. It's a special way to manage people, and it wasn't just myself. If you spoke to any of the staff, you know, from everyone from cookers to cleaners to stadium staff, like he he, he would he would stop and have a chat with you. And I think that's just a I think that's the way to manage uh, these days. But yeah, so I came back from Dumbarton, um, communicated with the club and stuff like that. Decided um, that my time at Celtic was was up and. Um, to be honest with you, uh, it wasn't. Obviously, you want to stay at Celtic. You want to you want to stay there for as long as you can. You want to play in the first team. But um, I, I I I knew myself that um, you, you, if you're being honest with yourself, you think, but you know what? I've had a great time here. I had a, I've had a great season at Dumbarton. I'm going to go elsewhere and I'm going to kick on. And you never know. You might be back in a few years' time playing playing at the club. Yeah, it's see as well as you said there about Brendan Rodgers. I, I think that's actually. Amazing what he done in his part in terms, as you said, you weren't actually part of his team, but he still took the time to take you in, speak you through things, tell you what he think think is going to happen in the future for yourself, and give you advice. And a lot of people obviously don't see that behind the scenes. They think it's cutthroat, and you're just told you're going, and that's it. And it's good to get that side out in terms of yes, you're going to get released, but the manager took you in, and explained why, and this is going to happen in the future. Here's clubs or whatever that I would suggest joining. And the club you did end up joining was Dundee United. Yeah. And how how was that? Did was that like interest you heard straight off the bat? Was it a club recommended to yourself that, or was it one of them ones where you thought there's a couple of clubs interested in me, but don't the United attract the most? Yeah, so it was um, when the season comes to an end. It, it, you, you know, a lot of players have got agents that look after them, and they, they they speak to different clubs and stuff like that. And at the time, it was 
it was Dundee United, um, Party Dasho and Queen of the South, who were all in the champion. I think they were all in the championship. Yeah, they were all in the championship. So that was my three options. But um, to me, the best option or the, the most exciting option was Dundee United because they were the biggest of the three clubs. Um, they had a great training facility, a lovely stadium, and um, they had real aspirations to get promoted back into the Premiership. And at the time, um, I remember discussing it with my agent, and, I, and we were kind of saying, listen, great club, go there, good season, get promoted, um, and maybe use it as a stepping stone for elsewhere. Um, but little did I know it was going to be two years of playing hell, but not, not uh, I mean playing hell, as in football hell, but off the pitch I learned a lot. I learned, I learned a lot um, in the last kind of two years when, when I was there. I think go the way I wanted it to. But as I said to you earlier, it's football. You have you have good yeah. times and you have bad times. And now you find yourself back at Dumbarton. Yeah. Do you do? And how's that going for you at the moment? Uh, well, again, it's, it's I mean it's it's been strange because so essentially in my half my half, uh, six months since my contract done United, I did my knee, so I was out for a year with my ACL. And then for the last six months of my contract, I went on loan to Dumbarton and then COVID hit and we basically didn't play any football for the best part of nine months. So it's been a very stop start last couple of years, but um, we, I, I, I was always, I, as soon as Dumbarton became available, I knew, knew it would be an option. I, I wanted to go back because I'd really enjoyed it the first time around. Um, and it, I was, it was going well. We'd, we'd started playing again at the start of this year. Obviously, the game's allowed to be back on um, because uh, we were doing our testing and stuff like that. Uh, but it's been a pretty intense last three or four months of the season because they were trying to cram a lot of games in. So we're, sometimes we're, I think we played, at one point we played eight or nine games in two weeks, which Whoa. was carnage. So I needed all my, my supplements then. I needed my cherry pills, <laughs> my polyvitamins, my protein. <laughs> so that kept me going. That kept me fueled. Uh, and then, unfortunately, the last, was it three weeks ago, I got Brian Graham, part of striker, fractured my eye socket. So I'm just recovering from that now. There's rumours going about there's going to be a pay-per-view fight between these two in a couple of months' time. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't fancy my chances. Guy's got a, he's, he's a tall guy. But listen, well, I would say, I would say you're injured at the moment and you're on the comeback and stuff. You've, you've seen the doctors. and Do you have a time frame when you might be back playing football? Yeah, well, because just now is the off-season, so it's just uh, it's, it's coming to the end of May, so I'll be, I'll be fine come the end of June, you know, when, when all football goes back. Um, for, for pre-season training and stuff so that's good if, if there was a time to get an injury it's probably a good time yeah get it out of your system so to speak yeah. but as, as you said there Sam they tried to cram a lot of games in and you yourself you've been a busy man because we've been trying to plan this interview for nearly the best I'm part one. of a month now <laughs> yeah but I mean you've done TikTok you're doing Instagram you're doing your coaching with with the guys you're seeing footage that on Instagram as well looks fantastic how's that all going for you and where did that come about what made you Go in. I know you said it before the kind of captain role at Celtic and things have led you down the coaching path. But what uh, made you take that opportunity to be like, ah, I'll just do it and see, see where it goes? Um, so to be honest with you, it, it's it's been it's been on for a year now, and I do I do love it. I've really learned. I, I I do love coaching. I've got a real passion for it. Um, but it started a year ago, and the reason it started was purely out of of just kind of luck and, and chance. I was sitting in my room just during the first lockdown. And I thought to myself, I'll take my mates for a um, a workout on Zoom one weekend. So I did that and I posted it on my Instagram story. And literally from there, I was doing loads of these online uh, Zoom classes with pals. And I ended up um, making a bit of a business from it. And then when things started to open up again, um, I started doing, I started posting videos of some of the football sessions I do myself. Um, and then from there, I started coaching some of the players, like guys like Aidan Isbutt and Joe Thompson and Calvin and Jamie, some of my mates. And then it just kind of grew arms and legs. It turned into a coaching business um, where I do, you know, one-to-one coaching online and, and in person. Um, and I've just started making um, kind of videos, as, as you said, on TikTok and Instagram and sharing essentially everything I've learned um, from my time at Celtic and Dundee United and Dumbarton and playing with the Scotland national teams. Um, I've probably just realised I've got a wealth of knowledge that a lot of people um, can take a lot from and, and you know, improve yeah. their body, improve their mind, improve their football, um, that kind of thing. The, the thing that interests me is when you're doing the, the TikTok of your routine from like game day or recovery day and it's all the proteins and food you should be eating. And on TikTok, is it over a million likes you have at the moment? Yeah, I, th- I, think, so. well, I think it's over a million views anyway. Um, yeah. 
that's, yeah, that's incredible. The, t- the TikTok seems to have, uh, I don't know, it seems to be going, it's found the right algorithm. Uh, every time I post it, um, I get a lot of feedback. Some, some, it's funny though, like no matter what you post, I'm trying to post completely, you know, educational content that, that's got no, like nothing negative, but you're still, you're still getting, you know, guys that are commenting stuff like slating you, like saying, oh, you shouldn't <laughs> be doing this, or you shouldn't be doing that, or this is nonsense, you know, I'm getting slides. So I post one the other day and it's like uh, pre-match routine and someone comments, oh, all this for a, su- for a Sunday league game. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but man, I, I quite like it. I, I I like having a bit of banter with these guys and stuff as well. Yeah, and it, it's all going well for you. And again, we wish you luck for the future, whatever your coaching takes you and your football with them, Barton. But I give you the challenge to end the podcast today of giving me your ultimate five aside team of players you've played with. Have you managed to script one together? Is it well? I'm not going to lie to you. I looked at the question and I wrote down a five aside team, and I've only play, played with one of the players. I wasn't sure if it was a. Uh, well, uh, whatever you've got down, that will do, because it's took a month to get it this far, so we'll, we'll go <laughs> what you've got. Right, so I, in, in goals, I've got Ederson, you know, he's a versatile player, yeah. very good with the ball at his feet, so he's almost like uh, an outfield player as well. At the back, I have Ramos, you know, aggressive, aggressive player, with my favourite, Kieran Tierney, he's a Ooh. stick on, he's a stick on in there. And then we've got two footballers, we've got Messi and Neymar. I mean, you can't beat it. Ederson, Ramos, Kieran Tierney, uh, Messi and Neymar. Unbelievable. What, Unbelievable. what a, what a five-a-side team that would be. Yeah. I can't believe you've played with all the end players, Sam. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if they would remember playing with me, though. <laughs> <laughs> but look, Sam, that's us finished with this, the show, the podcast. Have you enjoyed your time with the Celts? Yeah, it's been brilliant, Stephen. It's been great chatting to you. Yeah, no worries. And thanks for coming on. We do appreciate it. And everyone who's listening, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. And until we speak again, stay well and keep safe. Hail, hail.